Hello, welcome to today's edition of Pegasus Test. On today's edition, we're going to review the inaugural semester of One Shepherd in West Virginia. Semester one covers movement to contact, mobile defense, and passage of lines. Now in the Warrior Basic course, you go over some, as they say, basic things. The first thing they teach you is operation of the Miles 2000 system. When you're at One Shepherd, you're using AR-15 rifles equipped with Miles, specifically Miles 2000 or Miles IWS. And one of the things you have to learn is how to pair your rifle or marry it to your system that you're wearing. Because Miles consists of a harness uh, worn over your body and a halo worn around your cover. And then there's a emitter called SATS on your rifle. You have to pair your rifle to your sensors to be active. So they teach you how to do that. After you've learned the miles and how it works, and then they take you into some weapon manipulation exercises. <clears throat> and there you learn how to load the weapon. You also learn how to operate the safety. You learn how to reduce malfunctions, uh, basically tap wrap and excess. And they have you go through several drills on how to do that. I look, I got a malfunction, I'm going to tap the bottom of the magazine, I'm going to rack it. Now remember, there's no round in here, so this bulk here is going to... And after you have done weapons manipulation, you move on to firing positions. I, how to hold the weapon, how to employ it, what positions to be in, and what the benefits are of each position that you're using. If I were to uh, well, put this elbow up, that would be bone support. Everyone get in this position. All things to consider. You did a sitting position. Let it go slowly. Yeah, yeah. So, my yeah, hole. <laughs> sitting down. The same sort of knee thing applies here. So if you're sitting in an observation post, listening post, right? Well, that's the very last one. Inherently the most stable. Prone. Prone. Somebody want to demonstrate prone for me? Sorry. Now there's a couple different ways of doing prone. Am I seeing both demonstrated here just naturally and natively? Yeah. Yeah. I am. Cool. Check this out. So he's got heels down, both feet spread. He's relatively flat. See the shape of his back? His shoulders are roughly the same height. He's got one leg kicked forward in your traditional army man pose. Right? <laughs> After that, they move on to individual movement techniques. And in those individual movement techniques, cover low crawl, high crawl, a modified crawl, and how to do a three to five second rush. But his weapon is braced up on his forearm, right? So it's out of the dirt. He's protecting his weapon from the elements. But he's at the same time, he's down into the ground. So if rounds are coming over him, no higher. He's talking about grazing fire. Who remembers that line from Red Dawn? What's grazing fire? We're waiting for that. So he's he's still moving, right? But he's keeping his body as low as humanly possible. All right. So that's what that's what we mean by low crawl, right? Ever see how his weapon is? He's moving because he has to move. He's taking fire. He's trying to get from point A to point B without getting shot. All right, so he's got a little bit more safe area, and now he's going to transition to a high crawl. All right, so he has a little bit more room to work with. He can move. He can see where he's uh, needing to look, look around where he's going. But notice he's still maintaining a very low profile, right? So when you're out there during the FTX or STX and you're snooping and pooping, right, you're not taking enemy contact, you're probably going to be employing this uh, individual movement technique. This is when it's like, you know, it's by watching Tracer and, and Impact, let's say two meters, head high and above, right? So. Ready, ready, weapon on safe. I'm up. He sees me. I'm down. Set. It's set. They say set. I know it's my turn. I go. Safe. I'm up. He sees me. I'm down. And after you've been taught IMT, they then step into travel techniques. Uh, the use of the relevant hand and arm signals. Traveling in a file. Traveling overwatch. Bounding overwatch. And they go... Uh, through the formations that you would use on a patrol then. And those would be what hand and arm signals to use to deploy into the formations, going into the wedge, the file, and or the echelon right or left as appropriate. And as in any movement, you have security halts. And they uh, 
go over uh, what's the uh, hand and arm signal for uh, going to security halt, what are your SOPs to do while in the security halt, how you maintain 360 secur security and form a perimeter. Moving on from there, you learn how to do uh, crossage of a danger area from small danger areas like a road where there's minimal risk and you do what's called the patch the road technique to more deliberate crossing like crossing wide areas like a field. Also one of the things you learn is communication and in communication you learn how to use the TA1 phone uh, along with the DR8 reel. In addition to wired comms you learn wireless communications and that's done by use of the PRC68-128 class series of radios. Also they cover land navigation. Now in the basic warrior course it's very basic. They have another course called land navigation that goes very much into depth to this technique but in this course basically you learn how to get your pace count and we did that by marking off a hundred meter area marching back and forth four times and then taking the average of those four times to know what our pace count was over 100 meters. Uh, they went over the use of pace beads as well. And last but not least, uh, you do a lot of night operations at uh, One Shepherd, and to prepare you for that, they taught everybody the use of the D300 night vision monocular and the mounting system. And at One Shepherd, uh, it's a second generation device to D300, and it can mount to your weapon or come out to a helmet or skull crusher by use of a J arm. And they're very specific about teaching you how to use this weapon, uh, excuse me, how to use this sight on your weapon and also the proper technique for using it on your helmet so you don't break the J arm. So the second day of Basic Warrior started the same as the first day. We woke up 0600 and we had some PT, did some stretching and did more bayonet drills this time, learning a few more maneuvers, maneuvers than we learned on the first day. After that, we went ahead and launched into classes. And those classes were hasty attack, react to contact, break contact, hasty ambush, and react to near ambush. For the hasty attack and react to contact lesson, we learned how to use the relevant hand and arm signals or vocal commands, establish a base of fire, maneuver an element on the enemy flank, assault the objective in accordance with coordinated lifting and shifting of fires, and then reconsolidate and reorganize the force. When we went on to break contact, we learned vocal commands are important, establish a, fire, a base of fire in the overwatch, maneuver out of the engagement area, and reconsolidate and reorganize once you're out of the engagement area. Hasty ambush, much the same thing. Use of relevant arm, hand and arm signals, establish formation in accordance with your SOPs, initiate fires with violence of action, and then once it's over, re reconsolidate for security and reorganization of the force. When we uh, reacted to near ambush, we uh, used the vocal command to identify the ambush type and direction. Get your butt out of the kill zone. Engage your enemy with the most violence of action as you can muster. Dislodge the enemy ambush team. Put him on the defensive. Force him off his position. And once you've done that, establish security, reconsolidate, and reorganize your force. After the classes, the One Shepherd Warriors that were going through the Light Leaders class came and joined the Basic Warriors, and they took up leadership positions. They did not have Miles Gears on, nor did they have their weapons. This was so they could learn to maneuver their fire teams, which are their weapons. And we were put into an exercise where we moved into a tree line, and two opposing units were forced to come in contact with each other. And at that point, the two uh, teams had to engage each other, and the team leaders of each of these teams had to maneuver their elements against the enemy. It was fast-paced. It was a tight tree line, so uh, distances were abbreviated. Uh, the, the action was close, and you know, people, a lot of rounds went off. Uh, a lot of kills were scored. A lot of guys got lucky due to Miles armor. But as soon as you got hit, you rotated out, they reconstituted uh, you, and sent you back into the fight. So the people doing the light leaders course had the maximum opportunity to lead their fire teams. Also, by not having miles of gears on the leaders and not having weapons, they were removed the temptation to engage in the firefight themselves, thereby forcing them to maneuver the elements of their teams and allowing them to stay in the fight when in reality, they might have been taken out. It was a very good practical learning exercise. 
upon the completion of the uh, exercise, uh, we had our uh, basic warrior uh, ceremony. People who were attending the basic warrior class for the first time were awarded their One Shepherd patch and introduced into the uh, family of warriors that is One Shepherd. At that point, after the formation, we secured, had some lunch, and then we moved into PMCS where we cleaned our weapons, we cleaned our gear, and we prepared for the STX that was following the next day. At this point, this ended the first uh, part of the semester, and unfortunately, not everyone could stay due to work and family commitments. So the people that had to leave after the completion of Basic Warrior left, turned in their gear, and the rest of us stayed on to begin the STX. On day three, the two-day STX period began. Now, the STX consisted of a series of exercises. Our first exercise of the day on the STX was a movement through our area of responsibility and to find out if any enemy were in the area. Uh, we had a full squad size element and it turned out we had several enemy contacts from an enemy unit approximately fire team in size. And the purpose of the exercise was to allow the um, patrol leader to control his fire teams and maneuver them as a weapon. After lunch, the second exercise of the day is to do a link up. And we had to move out in a squad sized element consisting of two fire teams. And we had to link up with a resistance fighter at a specified location on the map. So we moved out, did seals halt, got eyes on the objective, established overwatch, moved into the objective, turned out that there was no link up. Uh, contact wasn't there so then we proceeded back to friendly lines and conducted passage of lines by uh, use of VS-17 panels for, com for communication. The third exercise of the day was a night exercise and took place once it really got dark. Our guide led us out of our patrol uh, fob and from there we mu moved up as a squad sized element and our mission was to go to our limited advance, see what enemy were in the area. So we moved out, conducted our, our listening halts, and then as we were moving up, uh, the enemy made themselves known by lighting off fire and popping up star clusters. And this really added some realism effects as we took fire from the front, yet when the star clusters went up, they did a very good job at illuminating the area. And when a star cluster goes up, the one thing you can't do is maneuver because that just highlights where you're at. It turns out uh, that a member of our team had inadvertently turned on their IR light on their night vision device and because of that been giving our position away the whole time. So the OP4 knew exactly where we were at. Even though we were following good procedures by following the tree line, staying in the shadows and all that and taking positive steps to maintain control and to uh, mask our movement to the enemy by inadvertently leaving that IR light on, we totally uh, broadcasted our position and provided an uh, aiming point for the enemy. However, that being said, once contact was established, we went through break contact procedures. The withdraw unit draw withdrew in uh, good order. We ended up only taking one casualty, which un while unfortunate for this type of uh, ambush was pretty good. And we were able to get back to our lines in order and then we were able to establish both far and near recognition. Our far recognition was done through uh, radio comms. Our near recognition was uh, by blue signal light. Once that was done, we counted our people back in and we indexed and had an, AF an AAR. Unfortunately, I don't have any video of the nighttime attack, but look in the link below. You'll see a link to Brent 0331's video that he made being the OP4 for this exercise, and you'll get to see the effectiveness of, of the star flares and also how the fact that our IR light left on inadvertently cued him into our position. On the second day of the FTX, we did not do traditional PT. What we did is we did a ruck march. And the pur purpose of this ruck march, it was about 2,500 meters, was to let everybody see how their packs were riding and if they needed to make any gear adjustments. Um, this was a very important phase of the exercise. And some people made the most of it. 
uh, some did not. Some of us, like me, got great results on the practice march and it all fell apart on the FTX, but that's a story for later in the video. After our ruck march, we moved into a class on mobile defense. And we did this a pretty unique way. It was done with Nerf guns and isomats. One team got a Nerf gun that had about twice the range of the other team's guns, and it had a high ammunition capacity. Uh, the members uh, that were not firing, because we only had the one gun, everybody else had their isomat, and they were to use them as shields to defend the gunner. And our objective was to get into enemy territory, find a box, flip it over, and under that box was a prize. In this case, it was a candy bar. The other team had the exact same mission. They had to get into our area, find their box, and get their candy bar. The difference was the opposing team had four guns, but they were limited in range. It was about half the distance of what our gun was capable of, and that gun only had three to five rounds of ammunition, and they did not have shields. And the results were very interesting. We ran the exercise four times. The first time it was just a general melee by both sides and eventually numbers just whittled away uh, people and we were stopped about a quarter of the way to our objective. Uh, the second time we decided to be more coordinated. We made almost like a Roman phalanx of shields and we um, allowed our gunner to fire over the top of that. That worked somewhat as we inflicted far more casualties on our uh, enemy than the first time. However, we got maybe a third of the way to our objective instead of, of a quarter of the way there. Uh, at that point, the two teams switched sides. So our team became the one with the pistols and no shields and limited ammo. And the other team became the one with uh, the high firepower but only one gun and, and having shields. Uh, in that one, they actually achieved their objective. They got through our defense. And the thing is, we got tied down, is what happened to us. Uh, each of the teams did not act in a coordinated way, and while we inflicted casualties and took their main gun out, uh, that had no effect on them achieving their mission. Matter of fact, devoting resources to taking out their main firepower probably weakened our defense. On the last go through, uh, we did a more coordinated effort and broke up in teams and coordinated and focused on their people and we prevented them from uh, achieving their uh, goal even at the last minute. Uh, in sight of it, we did stop them. So it was a learning experience by constant repetition and applying the lessons that we learned. Each side got better. Each side learned lessons from what they did. So the next iteration, each side was applying the lessons they learned, which was great because you'd think you'd learn this great lesson from the first exercise, apply it in the second, and find out, well, your enemy learned too, and he applied the lessons he learned. Sometimes that was good for you, and sometimes it wasn't. The last half of the day of the uh, S, uh, STX was taken up by PMCS, uh, cleaning of weapons and gear, and for the people that had to, for uh, work or family reasons, go ahead and depart at that point, they went ahead and did so while uh, the rest of the people began to prep for the FTX. With the completion of the STX, the FTX kicks off. And for this FTX, we were running the scenario where the Balto-Slavic Republic, or BSR, was soft invading the Republic of Sarmatia. Uh, our squad, first squad, was uh, picked to be the Sarmatian Defense Force. And a second squad was picked to be the BSR elements infiltrating into our area. We were given our situation, which was BSR was invading. We had to get as much information on them as we could. We were to avoid contact where possible, but get as much information on the enemy force as due to its size and its activity, its composition, and where it was locating. Were they setting up patrol bases? Were they coming in in force with rocks because they intended to stay? Or were they just doing a little bit of probing reconnaissance? So, our task mission was to go out into the uh, uh, northern parts of Sarmatian territory, recon the area, see if we could find BSR elements, and find out what their activity was. First squad was a seven-man unit, 
and it was made up of three teams. Alpha Team was a two-man team, uh, so was Bravo Team. Charlie Team was the command element, with Brent as the patrol leader and myself uh, nominated as assistant patrol leader. And Matt Getters bringing up our rear as our medic. As patrol leader, Brent's job was to plan out our mission so we could accomplish it in accordance with our directive from hire. My mission as assistant patrol leader was to procure all equipment necessary that would allow us to successfully complete, complete our assigned mission. And part of that was I went ahead and got DR8 rolls. I got TA1 field phones. I drew PRC-68 radios and all the night vision and lights that I could, along with consumables such as ammunition, smoke grenades, and pyro. In addition to that, we uh, drew meals and a water supply so that we could step off on this mission with the ability to sustain it for a three-day period. While Brent was conducting the planning of the operation and I was procuring all the necessary equipment that the squad was going to need for the operation, the team leaders took over and conducted pre-combat inspections. We laid out all our gear and we went through the gear list that was required for the mission by the numbers. Uh, once the team leaders inspected their teams, then as APL, I came in and checked the team leaders and their team members. And then finally, we moved over to our terrain model where uh, Brent gave us our operational plan and, and his commander's intent. After completion of our PCI, Dr. Larson gave everybody a lesson on face camouflage. To see the full video about this, check out the link below because Brent0331 did an excellent video on it. When we were ready to step off on the mission, even though our patrol base was going to be in the south of our area of operations, we stepped off, off to the north for two reasons. The first reason, we noticed that there were second squad people still in the FOB and that would observe our departure, so we wanted to uh, implant a bit of disinformation. Also, by heading off to the north, we uh, got a chance to survey the terrain that we would be uh, operating in as we looped into where we wanted our patrol base to be. Upon arrival at our patrol base, or I should say our initial patrol base, we uh, cached our rucks and all team leaders gathered together with the PL and the PL went over his plan for that afternoon. So we're currently located just southwest of that building over there. All right, just about 50 meters, not very far. So easy, easy place for us to uh, link up. Remember, that building up there is a Mars rendezvous, okay? So at 1930, every swing and tick is there. stay together until we reach phase line green. Once we get the phase line green, your team will break off. Okay. You will push across and get in that. You know that tree line to the west of the pond? Yeah, we'll you this up where you guys used high art. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You'll take that and then more. So right now we're at phase line. Yeah. We're at phase line blue. We're gonna push across. We're gonna go up to the house. We're gonna cut across that field. I want, I want large dispersion between us as we cross across that field. Stagger column, okay? Until we get to the next tree line. 
It's just catty corner to us, so it's going to be northwest. Once we get there, yes, where I was the other day. Once we get there, we're going to release your team. Yes. Your team is going to start heading northeast. Northeast. Yeah. Do you have a compass? Yeah. Okay. You push northeast until you get essentially where we were coming in. Yeah. Right, so that route is going to be familiar to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you go all the way out there, and then you are pretty much just backtrack. Yeah. All right. Now that I'm looking at this, I should release him sooner. No, we'll keep them with us. We'll go all the way to Phase Line Green, so where the fog is. And the original plan, we're all gonna we're all gonna break from Phase Line Green. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you'll you'll push over that next tree line. We'll go north. Right. You at that point are going to continue up the tree line. Right to to the fence, and then you're gonna go northwest. Oh, uh, okay. So we're all gonna be we're all gonna be essentially like this. Tree, right? Santiago's guys are going. Up. Santiago's guys are going up this tree line. Yeah. All right. We're going middle. You're going following the tree line. The tree line to the fence. And then and once you get the fence, you're going to go north. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. We're not linking up. No. no. We'll link we'll up back here. Got it. No later than 1930. 1930. Got it. So <coughs> get there. Get there. Hold tight. Figure the time it takes to travel back, then we'll move back. Yeah, so keep an, keep an eye on your watch. This is Shrikon. Yeah. What you see, how many do you see? Are oh, they moving with packs? Yeah, time. Is it yeah. just uh, patrols? Yeah, time. Salute report. Yeah. Um, what do you hear? You know, if you hear vehicles or anything like that, do not make contact unless it's self defense. Okay. Right? Got it. If you make contact, just start bounding back. Start making your way back to here. Yeah. And then hold hold firm at the barn. Yeah, don't come down. Secure here. the building and just hold on. Got it. All right. Any question? All right. You feel good about this? Yeah, let's do it, man. Okay. Um, I'm going to get us get us online over here. Get the right step. I want radio check. Remember, radio checks every hour on the hour. All right, so go brief your guys. When you when you got your guys fully briefed, give me the thumbs up, and then we're gonna get online right here, ready to step. All right, and we'll get our radio checks. Once we got our radio checks, we'll step out. Everybody should have a chow on them and their rain gear on them, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll eat your evening chow out there in a recon position. All right. Okay. Just remember, both people don't eat at the same time. Yeah. That's all security for the markets. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mission takes priority over fucking eating chow. Yeah. Got so it. Just FYI. After the PL gave his briefing, team leaders split off and briefed their teams on what they were to do for the afternoon's recon mission. After each of the three individual teams broke up and stepped off on their individual paths for reconnaissance, uh, our team went up a few hundred meters, crossed a danger area, and then we had a sills halt to see if we had been detected by the enemy. What's your assessment so far, Brent? So here we are at Casualty Collection Point. We've gone out, we've had a meeting look engagement. We made a sill stop. We'd been there for a period of time and we had heard nothing, seen nothing, had moved out. Within minutes of moving out, we made enemy contact. Uh, two of us were up front, one in behind. Uh, we heard the enemy fired. We heard them getting online. We popped smoke because we knew we were against a superior force and tried an attempted retreat. Uh, two of us got hit, one made it, and was able to continue mission. After spending time in the casualty collection point and respawning, we were able to link up with uh, Matt Getters from C-Team after Brent and I had been killed in the engagement. Uh, we found out later, 
after the FTX that it was a meeting engagement as I originally surmised and that we had happened upon them before they had gotten set. We did not hear them in our sills halt. However, because getters had survived the engagement, we had the intel of where we had run into the enemy. We then moved up, established a watch on that position uh, as long as we could, and then due to time, we had to abandon the watch and head back to make our 1930 link up time back at the patrol base. So upon return to the patrol base, we set up our defensive positions. We had three distinct positions, Alpha Team on our left, Charlie team in the middle as the command, and Bravo team on the right. The two positions were linked to Charlie team by the use of the DR-8 and TA-1 field phones. This was so we'd have secure communications and also we wouldn't be depleting our batteries for our radios. So after doing an extensive patrol of our area of operations and fire team force that included even finding the enemy's watering point, we did not find the enemy patrol base. We returned to our lines just before dawn, and instead of going to the traditional stand to at dawn to prepare for enemy attack, we had a good feeling that the enemy had uh, not intended to attack us that morning, so we delayed stand to to just before 0800. Uh, at 0800, we stepped off on the day's patrols with essentially a repeat of what we had done the previous day to patrol the ground we already had to make sure the enemy had not moved in on us during the night or we had missed them on those night patrols. Uh, when, we reached our, when we reached our release points, each of the teams went down their recon areas and pretty shortly into the recon, Charlie team, of which I was a part of, we sma smacked into an enemy force of significant size, of at least double our size, so probably about six people. Uh, we had an engagement, signi inflicted significant casualties on them, but took a few ourselves. So, back at the casualty collection point. It's not my favorite place to be. At this point, we had fixed the enemy. We knew where they were. They were basically west of the tree line of the fob. We were probing to the west and uh, we're trying to fix them in place so units can maneuver in on them. Problem we ran into. So there was a natural joint pipe. The rules of the game are that you cannot fight in the fob. That created a natural choke point. So I was point man. I went through. I got through. I saw something suspicious. Stopped. Was checking it out. Shot went off. Wasn't close. I fired back. I think I'm a victim of Miles' armor. Uh, they're pretty good covered in concealed position. I didn't see them until I was in the kill box. Launched off several rounds. Another head popped up. Launched off several rounds at that. Took several near misses. Finally, they got me as I was a, as my mag ran dry. So here I am at the casualty collection point and we'll have further updates. At mid-afternoon, we went ahead and returned to our patrol base slash defensive position. At that point, we went to 50-50 security so some guys get some rest, eat some chow, or in the case of Brent, make a cup of coffee and restore his superpowers. Uh, once that was done, uh, Brent and Richard Santiago, our alpha team leader, went ahead and did another recon patrol throughout the afternoon, returning late uh, afternoon, actually early dusk, just as the sun had set, and they uh, came into our lines and reported that they had seen no enemy activity whatsoever. At that point, we decided to go to 50-50 security again, and we were going to launch uh, patrols later in the night. However, right after the uh, moon had come up, uh, a severe thunderstorm moved in with uh, high winds, thunder, lightning, and uh, just a torrential downpour. Uh, immediately our positions flooded and we were forced to retreat into an abandoned uh, farmhouse near our position. At that point we decided the enemy was probably in the same position we were of just trying to deal with the weather. Um, so we went to single person security on 30 minute watches and everybody tried to dry out and get whatever sleep they could possibly get. 
At approximately 2300, the storm subsided. At 1200, Brent and I stepped off on a five hour patrol of the area of operations. We went to our northern limits, uh, the border of the BSR, and we went to our eastern limit, so, uh, and then we went to the west. Everywhere we went, we weren't finding the enemy until 0300. Uh, near the FOB, we uh, ran into an enemy formation, and through night vision, it appeared to be full enemy strength. And we figured they were moving on our uh, patrol base, that they must have located us somehow. Because the evening prior, while Brent was out on patrol, a deer had spooked near our position, and we thought the enemy must have been in our area. Turns out later that hadn't happened, the deer was just spooked naturally, but with that information, we Brent and I decided to engage the enemy patrol to drive them off, uh, and we were successful. And at that point, as soon as we engaged and we saw them uh, bounding backwards from uh, our fire, we dashed into the wood lines, made a radio call back to the unit to tell them to stand to to prepare for enemy attack. Now at that point, it later on turned out that we'd only run into another two-man enemy patrol and they had thought we were in the area suppressing them and they just went firm where they were at. We continued our patrol till 0500 return to the patrol base and we prepared, uh, told everybody to stand to, get ready to step off at 0630 as we were going to do a sweep of the entire area to force the enemy into a fight and drive them out. Well, you gotta give one shepherd credit. They take this um, military training simulation to the nth degree. This is true infantry training, because we just got rained on. Everything's now soaking wet. So, if you want real infantry training, this is the place you gotta come, because they even provide the rain. Just as we were getting ready to step off on our sweep operation that was going to fan out and move from the east to the west of our area of operations to force contact with the enemy and initiate a fight to drive them out, we got a frago. We were informed that the enemy was moving towards our position and that we were to stand form, firm in a defensive line. So we sat, we set in, and we waited. It turns out we didn't have a particularly long time to wait. Uh, slightly after 7 o'clock, the enemy attack began. Uh, we had one advantage. The rain from the night before had completely flooded the fields in front of our position, thereby cutting the enemy's avenue of approach down to just one, and that was in the Alpha Team sector. Alpha Team was giving orders to let them get halfway across the open area they had to cross to get to Alpha and then light them up. Uh, for the, thankfully for us, the enemy was slow in getting off on their attack and the morning fog that was in place had burned off. So Alpha let them halfway out of the tree line uh, over to our, their tree line and lit them up and instantly got three to four kills right off the bat. With the start of that firefight, uh, began the final uh, big fight of the FTX and it raged on for the better part of an hour. Uh, in the end we finally repulsed the attack. Um, at one point Alpha's position was overrun um, but uh, we formed a new line on Charlie's position and we were able to stop the enemy and eventually we had it down to just two guys and uh, we were able to uh, maneuver on them and eliminate them and then indexed was called. The inaugural semester of One Shepherd in West Virginia has to be, from my point of view, declared a success. We came, we learned, and we had fun. I would highly encourage you, that if you have any interest in this, to come to a One Shepherd class, be it here in West Virginia or be it in Missouri, Whatever's closest to you, whatever one's easiest for you to get to for whatever reason, that's the one you should go to. Uh, I'm going to go to the next one in Missouri in September, and I hope to see you all there soon.